Lilleman es astróloga, se dedica a la astrología tradicional y además tiene una maestría en botánica. Sus mayores intereses son la astrología horaria y también la astrología médica. En este video fascinante va a combinar ambas técnicas y nos va a mostrar cómo poder diferenciar en cartas horarias referidas a enfermedades si la enfermedad es del cuerpo o de la mente o el espíritu. Realmente esta ponencia me dejó boquiabierta. Es súper, súper interesante. Te invito a que te inscribas, el link está al pie de este video, para que puedas participar el 11 de febrero de la sesión de preguntas y respuestas en la que ella va a estar disponible para responder cualquier duda que te haya podido quedar. Nos vemos. Um, so we're going to take up a topic that obviously falls in body, mind and spirit, which is the medical astrology of body, mind and spirit. So now let's make sure we can do our screen advance. Yes, maybe. Okay. Well, um, as to what, how you tell the difference, because there is such um, a good literature in horary astrology and specifically medical horary astrology, this topic of body, mind, and spirit is an old topic. Uh, you can see references to this in Ptolemy's material, which we'll probably just briefly cover here, but um, it goes that far back. There have been uh, discussions, shall we say, we could also say arguments throughout the, the history of uh, astrology on the question of how you tell some of these parameters between body, mind, and spirit. This is a list I had compiled uh, and put in the appendix of traditional medical astrology to, to give people a sense of just what are the components that, um, that are involved with telling the difference. Now, here's the honest point. I seriously doubt that more than about one in 100 horror astrologers actually ever bother to look at a list like this. This comes up more when the horror question implies an issue that this might not be a bodily issue. But in fact, this is something that theoretically we should be doing every time we look at a medical chart. And that's what I'm going to put you through today is giving you a chance to, to look at it from that perspective, which means most of the charts I'm going to show you just look like conventional medical horrors. And we're going to see whether there's a spiritual uh, dimension to it. So basically, this gives you a sense of where the rules come from. And then what I'm going to expand and say, but this is not a complete set of rules, but it's enough for us to kind of extrapolate a list. So if a disease is strictly of the body, the, the ascendant and moon would be afflicted but their rulers are not afflicted, okay? And if you look over at the mind-spirit category, you'll see exactly the reverse. The ascendant moon are not afflicted, but their rulers are afflicted. So now you notice this is kind of one of those nice little binary either or choices, except that what do you do when the, then say the ascendant is afflicted and the moon's dispositor is afflicted? Ooh. All right. So, um, so most of the time, and you'll see this as we look through these charts, you get kind of a mixed reading because there's no, you know, we've got two different factors here, the ascendant and the moon, and then two different dispositors unless the ascendant is cancer. So you've got a, you know, you've got a mix here and they have more than one way to look at this. So now typical things, Mars are setting, Saturn afflicting the moon, but not the ascendant for the body. Mars or Saturn afflicting the ascendant, but not the moon. So, oof, you can have either Mars and Saturn irrelevant to, to the two, or you can have Mars and Saturn doing both of the two. So again, the, what looks at first like an easy distinction is messy in practice. But now we have a few things that are a little more specific and are actually get into something that's rather interesting. Since Rod mentions Jupiter and Pisces, here we are, Jupiter in the first or sixth is considered to represent a disease of the body, even though we would all be tempted to say, well, 
you know, when you're looking at questions of the spirit, Jupiter is kind of one of the number one planets that is on your list, especially if you're working traditionally. So, but that's a body situation. Well, one answer, it's not, it's not associated with the ninth, probably. Um, now, a sp specific one for mind spirit is the ruler of the ninth or twelfth in the sixth, because what that's saying, ninth is, of course, directly spiritual matters. The twelfth is witchcraft. And witchcraft comes into place here because uh, we have to do a little brief uh, foray into what uh, William Lilly would have meant by witchcraft or his contemporaries or the people before him. Of course, they were in a context where when they talked about witches, um, they were not talking about individuals in the 21st century practicing Wicca as a religion. What they were basically talking about is what we might now call compulsion um, obsession, brainwashing is another good word. Gaslighting is a good word in the, in the current context. All the different ways that someone can be psychologically manipulated, at which point I'm really tempted to say things like marketing. Um, but anything, the 12th house from this standpoint can represent any way that a person can be convinced to operate, even if subconsciously, on a level that isn't in their own interest. So the ruler of the ninth or the 12th in the sixth is literally saying that that person has gotten sick from a ninth house matter or 12th house matter. So that's a pretty direct argument and one that we can follow the astrological logic for. Um, the ruler of the first in the sixth is considered to be an indication of the body. Well, we understand when we're doing horaries about medical situations that when you have, for example, cross aspects between first and six, one way of saying this is the diseases of the querent's own making. That would be one indication of it. But it's certainly when the diseases of the own of the the querent's own making, the most general way to think of that, uh, or the most common is stress, which is that um you're in a toxic relationship with someone, but you don't want to leave or you don't feel you can leave or you feel trapped and you don't leave. And so that produces stress and you get sick. So that would be an example of the first sixth dimension. So this does tend to play out in the body. The ruler of the six is Mercury. Well, according to some sources, this is indicative of witchcraft. Uh, Mercury can be a real smooth talker. And so from that standpoint, there's that possibility, but that's not the universal usage of this because many, you know, I'm sure all of you who've done horary have seen plenty of horaries where the ruler of the six is Mercury and it was not a case of witchcraft, but it was a case of, as they would have said, nerves. Um, so this is one of those, you have to use this with a grain of salt rules. Now the moon in the 12th, as representing the body, whereas the ruler of the moon or ascendant in the 12th would be the spirit. Again, I'm not sure this is a strict rule that you can't violate, but I think where we can help to see the contours is that a couple of things are being suggested by the list. First of all, ninth and 12th are really where you're focusing on the, let's say the non-material levels of disease. Where Mercury is relevant to this list is the mental issue. But now when you get to mental, one of the issues you get into there is that historically, these issues of, of the mental life of the native, for example, in Ptolemy, was typically given by the combination of the moon and Mercury. Well, that kind of shows the prominence of the moon in all these lists, but of course, you know, that's not the only place the moon could come from on here. So Mercury does get involved, but Mercury really is part of the way of understanding the workings of the mind. And of course, the mind is involved with the mind spirit uh, portion of our equation. Okay. Oh, that, oh, when we get into house system, Reg, 
I'm, I'm one of those STA people. Yeah, what can I say? Um, now, as I mentioned before, it's highly unlikely that that many horary astrologers even look for this distinction distinction between physical and spiritual on a routine basis, to which we obviously should ask the question, why? Um, let's start with an example. Okay, and so here, you know, these are, as I mentioned, all in Reggio Montanas. Um, this was a question that I was asked by a querent who had a pain in her lower leg. And so she wanted to understand what was going on with her lower leg and specifically what she wanted was, what do I do about it? Okay, so uh, in these charts, I'm going to look a little bit at the astrology of the chart itself, and then we'll look at how it plays out on the mental, physical and spiritual level. And I will encourage everybody present who wants to uh, discuss the astrology of this to please do so. So I believe you have to ask to to speak, but I'm completely I'm completely happy with that in this whole section because I think we do better with this in a discussion. So to just bring you into the chart, it's a Capricorn rising chart. So our querent uh, is that Saturn, which you see in the first house. Um, you can also see here there's a Pluto component that's there. Um, since, uh, since I'm working out of essentially mostly William Lilly's rules on these matters, uh, and that whole lineage, I use the five degree rule with respect to planetary placements. So here, Mars is a little too close to the, uh, second house cusp to count as first house. Okay. Now, when you're looking at a medical chart in general, you look to the first house for vitality, the sixth house for sickness and the 10th house for what they used to call the physic, which is also we would now call the treatment or, and this is very important, it also gets used if someone is having a test of some sort, um, you would be looking at the quality of the 10th house then to show that the test, that they're getting accurate results. Okay, so here our illness area is coming out of Mercury. And so of course I brought one of these Mercury ruling the sixth house things here, right to front and center to to look at the question of uh, what we exactly want to do with this rule about Mercury. Um, so now my focus in this case was, you know, there, there are, from the standpoint of disease, there are diseases that are more likely to be potentially dangerous and there are diseases that are less likely to be potentially dangerous. The pain she had was internal. There was no visible swelling of the leg. Um, and so the, so what I basically was looking at here was, was the following, that we have mercury associated um, with the sixth house. And so initially what I looked at is, okay, what's going on with mercury? And you see here that Mercury is in Gemini. And so you go to look for its immediate aspects. And one of the things you see is that it's um, in a trine to Mars, um, Mars and Aquarius, not an especially strong uh, position for Mars. It's a peregrine planet. Um, the Mercury in Gemini is actually very strong. Uh, you have Saturn, also very strong, but retrograde representing the vitality of the person. Um, so what we have is a disease which suggests that there is a nerve quality to it, or is it spiritual? Okay, well, uh, now if you wanna talk about leg pain specifically, Aquarius of course rules the lower leg. Mars rules pain of all sorts. So that Mars and Aquarius seems to absolutely perfectly encapsulate the, the symptoms that she was having. So I looked at that, I looked at the trine with Mercury, um, which suggested to me since Mercury was still coming to Mars, that left untreated, the pain was likely to increase, okay? Uh, it's a trine, which means it's not as, in a sense, difficult as if it were a square. But still, 
the suggestion of the approaching aspect is this disease has not reached its peak. So that also tells me mm, better, better come up with some, some ideas here. Now, you'll also notice here moon in the 12th. So, and in all horror, you're looking at the moon. It's not just that, oh, well, I need to see what house of the moon is in to see whether it's spiritual, mental, or physical. It's we always look at the moon. The moon is in the 12th. The moon is relatively late in Sagittarius and about to go into uh, the sign of her detriment. So her condition currently uh, it is disposed by Jupiter, but it's about to become uh, it's about to become worse again if something isn't done. So that meant that I was going to look at the tenth house and look at at possible treatments. Okay, well, the 10th house is Libra, so that's Venus. Um, usually, when you're trying to sort out what treatments are going to be necessary, you look at some, you look at the, what planets are showing and then how you would translate that in a modern sense into treatment. Now, um, in the case of Mars, Mars traditionally is surgery. Of course, now we have several other alternative systems like acupuncture that we could use uh, as alternative Mars concepts, but we don't have Mars here. So that suggests to me that whatever is wrong with her at this point, it's not likely to be, um, to represent that she's going to need surgery. My, my usual method on this is if I see the inferiors involved with the tenth house. Uh, I'm thinking about things like either herbs or, um, in some cases, a diet itself. But more, I'm, I'm typically looking at least on a first level into something relatively uh, simple and uncomplicated as a way to look at it. And so, thinking about that Mars in Aquarius. One of the, there's an old idea of Aquarius as representing a kind of a sluggish circulation. And that's probably the fact that this is a fixed sign. And when you think of that in terms of blood circulation, one of the things you think about is the fact that it is so common as people age for them to have circulatory problems in uh, in their lower legs and feet. So thinking about that, I said, well, um, have you had issues associated with your legs in the past? Well, I have, was the answer. And I said, and um, what kind of issues do you have? And the answer was, well, in the past, I've had something like phlebitis. Okay, well, really easy call at that point. Uh, I suggested that she might take, uh, she might like to take some horse chestnut, which herbally is one of the most common herbs uh, for uh, any kind of issue like that. And so she did take some horse chestnut and the pain went away in about two or three days. So happy, happy customer. <laughs> which is always a good thing. But now let's look at this physical and spiritual dimension. So as I mentioned before, we have the moon in the 12th house, which is an argument of it being a spiritual disease. The part of spirit now in these charts, which I'm doing out of Sirius, this really funky looking thing right here is their representation of the part of spirit. Part of spirit's opposite Pluto. Now, not in the lists, but the part of spirit by its very nature suggests it may fall on the spiritual side of the equation. Um, we've seen here the, the leg pain issue. We have the Mercury ruling six, but again, is this automatically spiritual? Well, this is somebody who has had this issue in the past. Um, when I asked her how long it had been uh, since she'd taken the horse chestnut in the past, because she had used horse chestnut in the past. It was about five years and she just stopped taking it. So are we looking at 
Mercury as a as a spiritual matter? Or are we looking at Mercury as, well, after I stopped seeming to need it every day, I just kind of forgot about it, which is also potentially a Mercury issue. So I can't tell you that. But I can also tell you that just as we looked at the part of spirit being opposite Pluto, we have the part of fortune in the sixth house. Now, normally when we talk about the part of fortune, we're talking about it literally as fortune, as and you look at it from the standpoint of being good uh, financially. But the thing is, the part of fortune itself is one of what are called the hylegical placements. Uh, it's an old Arabic word. But and and you probably know it's somehow associated with oh my God, uh, predicting the length of life. I can go into a whole long thing about why I don't do that. But the essence of this is as a high legal place, it is involved with the body. Because if you are purporting to do something about vitality on the level of predicting life, you're talking about vitality in the end. And vitality is understood as a physical process. So just as we saw an indicator that there might be something spiritual through the part of spirit, we're seeing here again a bodily connection. Now we're going to deal a little later in this lecture with how you work with these differences of body, mind, and spirit, because there are some, let's say, attenuations in how you would deal with with uh, suggestions you might make to somebody. But what this chart shows is what I find typical. There's a mix of physical and spiritual components. Did she just get forgetful about the the circulation issues in her legs to use a, a you know a more simple version of this than giving the disease a name? Did she forget about it? Did she think that she wouldn't have to do anything else because well I handled it in the past? Um, I think there probably was some of that in this situation in the kind of Saturn approach there uh, represented by Saturn ruling ruling her might also suggest this kind of inertia issue as a possibility here. Um, but there isn't such a strong reading here about spirituality that you have to absolutely say, stop everything, doing some kind of conventional um, tradition, you know, in this case, traditional herbal approach to what to do is not going to work because it's spiritual. No, there's some issues in there which suggest maybe there are some, some factors perhaps in her lifestyle that she needs to look at, but it's not more. This was a client who came to me um, having had a bad eye operation. Now, I was going through the emails, uh, you know, earlier when I was preparing this and I didn't have written down in my notes exactly what eye operation it was. I'm assuming it probably uh, wasn't cataracts because, well, for one thing, it's rather unusual to have a bad cataract operation. But anyway, she came to me in order for me to elect the chart to correct what happened with this operation. So, um, so what we're looking at here is basically this is an event. Um, why was this a bad operation? Well, the, the first thing that we want to look at um, is the uh, is the condition of, of the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon rule the eyes. There's an old rule that in a woman, it's the left eye, in a man, it's the right eye for uh, as far as the sun's position and the reverse for the moon. My attitude about this is, uh, Honestly, I think there was way too much sexism in the old days about what were intrinsically male and female things anyway. So I err on the part of caution and in an electional involving the eyes, I fortify both the sun and the moon. I just think it's safer. Here, um, we've got a very nice moon in Taurus in the fifth, but we have the sun in the 12th. And we don't just have the sun of the 12th. We have a rather active 12th house here, we can see. Um, again, this is another case where, uh, well, here we have the, the part of fortune, part of spirit is again opposite Pluto. And here we have the, um, the part of, uh, uh, we, it looks like we have the part of fortune 
uh, opposite Saturn. So that's kind of a mess. We have the same planet, Venus, uh, as the 10th and 6th house rulers. Now, this is an interesting thing because when you draw the 10th and the 6th together, one possible interpretation of that, and you see it, that that planet Venus is kind of sitting right literally in the person's face in the first house, one possibility of that is, uh, unless you're very careful about it, um, this can um, result in uh, in a situation where um, your this the treatment makes the person sick. That's really the 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 you know the concern with this is that that's that's what can can result from this. So it's got an indicator there, and there's a second indicator, um, which is that Venus, that critical planet, was near a nebula. Now, nebula, there, one of the the foremost people in fixed starland in the 20th century was Diana Rosenberg, and she did a lot of research on basically the physical locations of stars in the constellations themselves, where, for example, an eye star could represent the eyes or a left shoulder star could represent the shoulder. But with respect to the nebula, um, that's the idea of a nebula, among other things, that you remember from Star Trek, of course, is that there are areas where you can't see through them. Uh, mm. The nebulas can represent a blindness issue or acute vision because it can go either way. Mm. And so this Venus was in a part of the star of, of the, you know, a part of the, the sky that had one of these nebulas. So already what this is saying is an operation at this time specifically related to the eyes is especially dangerous. So what you have here is you have, you've already got some indication of um, the treatment causing an illness. And now that planet, which is so prominent in this chart, is in the area of a nebula, indicating that there can definitely be additional eye problems associated with it. But now we look at this from the standpoint of the physical spiritual, and you see, as we saw immediately, three of the planets uh, uh, three of the placements here are in the 12th house already. You've got the ruler of the ninth in the 12th. You've got the part of spirit opposite Pluto. And, you know, and you have this situation which made us look at, at this, um, the same 10th and 6th house rulers, which does suggest, you know, definitely a physical component to it. And the presence of the, the part of fortune right at the 6th house here indicates that as well. So, again, a mix of circumstances, but now is the issue here with the, the 12th a spiritual issue on her part? Or is this that she's been put into a dangerous situation because of the chart? Now, that's an interesting uh, question as well. So, um, it's having to sort these things out, which is, I think, another reason why most astrologers are not paying so much attention to this. Clearly, she'd been damaged physically by this operation, so she's going to need uh, so she's going to need a follow-up operation to fix it. Anybody got any comments on this? No. This was uh, a question that was asked um, by by a querent about. Uh, a treatment that she was taking. And this was an alternative treatment. And so she wasn't sure whether the treatment was actually helping the condition or hurting the condition. There was certainly no improvement. And so she wanted to know, basically what she wanted to know is whether it's time to stop the treatment uh, and try something else. Okay, 
So now if we're looking at that, we see that uh, the, the vitality is given by Mercury. Uh, Mercury is in the seventh house. You can see that uh, Neptune there is very close to the descendant. So now that already is suggesting that the existing um, expert advice, this was not, this was an alternative treatment. So, you know, this isn't the physician, but it is the healthcare practitioner. Um, that with Neptune there, that the healthcare, healthcare practitioner was not clear, Neptune, uh, about what was going on. Um, in general, we've got Mars there right at the 10th representing the treatment. So Mars in general being a malefic, this is not an especially dignified malefic, which would make you feel uh, a little uh, more comfortable with it. It isn't peregrine because it does have dignity by face. But what we have, interestingly, is a mutual reception of Mercury and Mars. And so Mercury is ruling the 10th, Mars is in the 10th. Now, in horary, a mutual reception is not necessarily what you want in a medical circumstance. Um, because one way to think about this is Mercury and Mars just can't get out of each other's business. And Mars being, well, Mars, the lesser malefic and having to do with pain uh, and damage is going to basically lock into the Mercury and what you basically get out of this is a battle. And so there's, there's basically in a sense, a war going on here between two factors involving treatment that is long and drawn out and potentially can really seriously impact the vitality of the person involved. And you see here that Mercury is ruling not only the 10th, it's ruling the first. So what this suggests, now the disease is Saturn, the condition was a bone disease. So that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, but what this is suggesting is that the treatment was, what the treatment was doing was more impacting uh, her vitality than it was treating the disease. Because here, <laughs> the Mercury is involved with Mars, but not really impacting um, what was going on with Saturn. Mercury does come to a sextile of Saturn, um, but the main thing is it's like Mercury is caught up. And one way to think about a battle here is that the treatment method is not really addressing the disease, but is impacting the vitality. And that is exactly what was happening. So if we now look at this, is this a physical or a spiritual? We have no 12th house issues going on. So that suggests physical. The ruler of the ninth is in the eighth. Um, now I looked at that and well, what does that mean? Um, in, um, and then there's the question that I just raised about the affliction of Mercury and Mars. Well, the thing is, and this is perhaps the ruler of the ninth and the eighth, she died, not from this treatment, but from the disease. And it was some months later, but, um, the basically the this treatment didn't help the process and i don't think that if she hadn't been on the treatment it really would have affected anything because what ended up uh happening was that the entire diagnosis of what was wrong with her turned out to be wrong so there was a big diagnosis issue which again makes me think back to what therefore was the meaning of the Mercury Mars mutual reception? Uh, literally, the, the patient was fighting the wrong disease. But it wasn't, but you can't just look at the 12th and say, well, there's no witchcraft here because there was no witchcraft there. 
It was just a misdiagnosis. Okay. This is one, as a horary astrologer, you'll get. Um, every so often, is there a specific health problem? You know, many of us can go into periods of time where, well, maybe the best way to say it is we just don't feel like we're ourselves. But you can't, you know, as the observer of this, um, just pick out a symptom that says, this is it. So this gentleman had come to me and he just said he wasn't feeling right. And so he wanted to know if there was a specific uh, health problem that, that I could suggest that would give him some idea at least of where to go. Okay, so what we have here is you see the sun right there on the sixth house cusp. Okay, well, for one thing, I would look at that and say, as a medical hurry, that's pretty, uh, that's a pretty strong indication that he's, you know, this is a strong chart. You know, this is right on the mark. He's literally looking here for illumination about an illness and the sun itself is in detriment which is to say there's a damage to the vitality going on. Now, you start thinking about Saturn as the ruler of disease, uh, and you're thinking about the bones, you're thinking about the teeth, specifically because this is Aquarius, you may be thinking about the lower legs specifically, you might be thinking about circulation. Um, all of those issues are suggested by that possibility. Now, Mercury is the ruler of the, the querent, that Saturn ruling the disease is disposing the Mercury. Um, so that's already suggesting that his vitality is being impacted by this disease. You've got Jupiter in Virgo in the first house. Jupiter we normally look at for things like the liver. Um, but it's retrograde, it's in fall. So that Jupiter, whatever else we may say about it, is not helping his situation. So this chart is definitely suggesting um, that there are that are there are issues here that he's going to have to deal with. Well, now when I started to look at the possibilities for what this could represent, one thing when you see Saturn uh, so involved with the disease. If you're looking at that from a humoral standpoint, um, the humor of Saturn is black bile. Um, black bile can indicate uh, a number of things, but many of them are associated with toxicity and clearing toxicity. Now, what you can see here is Mercury's in the fifth, um, Pluto's in the fifth, Venus is in the fifth. So what we have is our biggest concentration of factors here is associated with the fifth. Now, there are some references um, in some of the 17th century sources to the idea that digestion is associated with the fifth. And you see here Saturn is ruling both the fifth and the sixth. So connecting those two together uh, suggest that the disease may primarily have to do with um, toxic matters in the digestion process, and specifically we've got a lot of black bile represented by all that Capricorn. The usual things represented with the digestive process, when you're talking about the stomach, you're talking about uh, actually acid, you know, it's typically called heat. When you, when you see something like digestive heat, we now call it acid because we understand the chemical nature of what goes on in the stomach. But traditionally, this was called vital heat. And looking at this chart with all this black bile, there's not a lot of vital heat being suggested here. So that suggests to me, anyway, that there's a lot of Saturn incomplete digestion. 
possibly blockages, because what does Saturn do? It blocks things up. So, um, so those were, with all that black bile being suggested, immediately the organ which is associated with black bile is the spleen. Um, this, so this now we've got an association with digestion issues and we've got an association with through the black bile and the spleen potentially with lymphatic issues as we would say now because the spleen is among other things the largest of the lymphatic organs and so so that's probably a place that he needs to, to get rid of this excess black bile because this is um something that uh is is definitely present in excess now you see the jupiter in the first house and jupiter of course the most common use of jupiter in as far as medical issues is the liver although it can also be um, the lungs or the hips those would be the the typical jupiter places jupiter and virgo again we see black bile um, we're more likely to say this is the liver piece than either of the other two because that doesn't quite mesh otherwise so probably some toxicity associated with the liver. So uh, so that is all uh, represented. Now, as we explore this further, we can also see that Mars is square both the sixth house cusp and the sun right there. Um, Mars, as far as an organ is concerned, uh, suggests the gallbladder because that's, you have the gallbladder. Again, I'm thinking more on the digestive side. It would also be the reproductive organs but that's kind of not fitting in with the same picture. We've got uh, an angry moon in Scorpio coming up to conjoin that Mars. Um, in fact, uh, you can look at this and see that the moon is actually translating the light from the sun to Mars. That suggests some potential gallbladder issues, so liver gallbladder. So, uh, essentially, I suggested to him that he have uh, that he have his his gallbladder checked, uh, and he have his liver function checks checked, and he did have some blockages going on there, and uh, he was able to treat that, and he got substantial re relief as a result of that. So, this raises. Probably the biggest issue about dealing with physical, mental, and spiritual issues in medical astrology. As long as you have a nice little list, which I gave you right at the beginning of the, the lecture, even I've said now you have to be a little creative about using it. But what do you do with a spiritual disease in the secular world? Um, in Lily's day, the moment you would say spiritual, you know, you could be going to talk to your minister. Um, you were in, you know, he was in an environment where there wasn't the diversity of ideas about spirituality that there is now. He was in a Christian context where um, the way that that would be dealt with was very specific and honestly not accessible to a lot of people in our current culture. Now, for people who are of that level of belief, then maybe you do deal with it on a spiritual level. Um, but many of us don't have such cut and dried ideas about how spirituality fits into our world. So I wanna stop and talk about that a little bit. Um, when I teach medical astrology, one of the things that I talk about with the students is essentially what we could call the biology of the soul and spirit. This goes back to the Greek material. And there, you know, the, the primary people we talk about are Plato and Aristotle. But in Greek times, before um, the Christian religion developed, the Greeks had an attitude about soul where, first of all, soul was not a unitary thing. We're not talking here about God. We're talking about soul. And from a biological standpoint, soul 
or spirit, I mean, there's some overlap of the terms, um, was essentially that which directed the physical body. The problem is how does a non-material, we could use the word cause, um, animate and operate a physical thing, which is what we would call the body. That's the whole big conundrum in this. Um, there's, if you want to follow this on a physical level, you can come up with a very interesting history of seeing the blood as basically the nexus point between the physical and the spiritual. But you need something like that to understand the process. But basically, the Greeks had this idea that there wasn't just the soul or shade, as we could call it, that is what went to the realm of Hades after death. Um, there were what were called body souls. And the body souls died when the body died. But what they were doing is they were helping to animate and work with the body while it was alive. And it was these portions of soul that in a sense had a direct bearing on how this whole body, spirit, mind conglomerate worked. Um, so if we think of this, how we can bring soul into this and spirit into this as being this connection with the physical body and whatever it is material that works beyond the physical body, then we can begin to talk about perhaps how we can work with this as a system to help people deal with the circumstances. Now, one of the ways that seems to be possible for this is the issue of dilution. When you look at Culpepper and all the other ancient sources about rulerships of plants, they are essentially operating completely on the level of the physical body. So what is the symptom in the body? However, what has become common in the last, let's say 150 to 200 years, is that there are ways to use herbs that aren't quite the standard way. So let's take dandelion. I'm, I'm getting ready for spring. I hope you are too. <laughs> okay. um, so dandelion is, among other things, a fantastic uh, liver detox. It works on, there are a couple of major diseases of the liver of which cirrhosis is one and dandelion fits in with that. It's an antioxidant. Um, it purges toxins, all of which makes me think that guy we were just talking about could have really used dandelion. Um, so that's the physical way you would work with it. You get a horary question about disease. Um, it's with a rulership of Jupiter, you'd be looking at charts where either Jupiter rules the sixth house or anti-Jupiter rules the sixth house because herbs were used both sympathetically and antipathically. So you see, you see either now here that last chart. Remember, we had Jupiter in uh, in Virgo, so we had an afflicted Jupiter, which is something we pot potentially could have treated with dandelion. But now we have three different systems that have developed, as I say, over the last couple of hundred years that end up be working in different situations. And I would argue with this, part of the way that it's working is on these alternative mental and spiritual levels. Now, the earliest one to develop as a system was homeopathy. And here we have to talk about uh, Sam, Samuel Hahnemann. Um, his system of working was with extreme microdoses because what he would do is he did dilutions to the point where in his uh, system of uh, concentration, any homeopathic solution at 30 C or greater dilution, there are no molecules left of whatever substance it is that you've diluted. So this is a system and this is what of course drives 
uh, modern doctors and, and, and such nuts. Because the idea that a substance could be working when it's not even there is a real head scratch if you're too much of a reductionist. But to which the answer is, well, it's not, it's probably not working on a physical level. Now, what I want you to concentrate on here is homeopathic. Okay, here I gave three symptoms. This is out of Berkey, who is one of the standard homeopathic sources from the 19th century. And I took some of his, um, those of you who know homeopathy will know what I'm doing. I took some of the italicized uh, symptoms uh, out of, out of his, his, uh, his work. Gastric headaches, bilious attacks, neuralgia of the knee. Okay, now, gastric headache and bilious attacks can both be associated with gallbladder. So you can see there's a somewhat overlap with the, the typical way that we'd use dandelion on an herbal level, which is to say either directly eating dandelion salads, this could be taking uh, capsules of, of dandelion, this could be making dandelion tea. In other words, we're talking about the conventional ways of doing uh, an herbal treatment. Um, so those two seem to work, but neuralgia of the knee does not come out of the herbal properties, but it did come out of Hahnemann's provings. Now, what Hahnemann did, which is so interesting, is that he would give someone who was, you know, basically a well person, not having any problems. He would give that person a dose of this substance, and then they would report changes in the body. Now, if this seems odd, let me tell you that this is a this is an experiment that I have been repeating in my medical master's class with my students. Uh, and it's very interesting to see how the provings work, because they do. So this is one level. We can see it's kind of similar, but it's not identical. Now, the there is this concept of microdosing. Microdosing is not the same as homeopathic. And it's not the same for several reasons. One is, is you don't produce the dilutions using the, the process that Hahnemann uh, worked out. It's also not microdosed to that point. But microdosing is based on something called the Schultz Arndt, Arndt rule, which was a uh, which was a notice of a, an activity process that was cleverly noticed by Schultz and Arndt in the 19th century. And it was this, that if you take a substance, pretty much any sub substance that has, as we could say, physiological activity, if you give it in a very small dose, not homeopathic, but physically present dose, what will typically happen with almost any substance, and this includes extreme poisons, is that in the very, very low doses, you will get a spike of uh, medical activity. Now, this is something interesting. If you go into a source like the Patanologia of William Salmon in the 17th century, he gives specific recipes for giving deadly nightshade as a medicinal herb, but they were in microdoses, as we would now say, extremely small quantities. But this was the point, in levels below the point that would kill you, it can actually stimulate you. Now, I inadvertently proved this myself when I was working on my master's on copper and mercury toxicity and algae because I noticed that in the lowest dose that I gave the algae, it actually stimulated growth. And then in the normal range for looking at toxicity, it killed them. Now, I thought that initial stimulation was an artifact, and I actually spent about six months trying to explain it. Well, the explanation was the schultz arms rule. This is what nearly everything does. This is now being used in areas like treating alcoholism treating certain drug addictions, that you can create stimulating doses in very low quantities. 
I now have my master's students doing experiments with this. And I, when I say experiment, I'm serious. It's an experiment. Um, and they're finding different, somewhat different, but similar results with what substances are doing in the microdose level compared to at the more macro herbal level, and which is also somewhat different than the homeopathic level. Now, the fourth thing is flower essences. Now, flower essences are kind of sort of like homeopathy, but from the beginning, flower essences have been recognized as working on spiritual levels. So here, what I've given you from um, a flower essence site are some of the symptoms that people use for dandelion if they're working with dandelion as a flower essence. And again, you see some of the same issues, but nothing specifically tagged to the liver. A more general issues having to do with basically the emotional calm that dandelion reduces tension. And this is when you talk about emotional calm, you're talking about tension, not necessarily so much physically, as emotionally, spiritually. Now, can you apply Jupiter as the ruler of dandelion at the flower essence level? Well, you probably can if you shift your idea of what the therapy looks like. So thinking about these these three other categories, the microdosing, homeopathic, and flower essence categories, may give us a way to begin to distinguish how you might suggest somebody work with this if you see a large spiritual component to the chart. Okay, um, um, is the dental work a good idea? Okay. The, this was a person who was looking at doing some serious implants. Um, and so they wanted to know whether the, the proposed uh, implants would actually help their situation um, or whether it might be better to do it some other way. Okay, teeth unequivocally sadder. Um, here we see it's Venus ruling the Senate, we see it's Jupiter uh, associated with the sixth house. Um, we do have a pretty fair component of things in the sixth house. And we have the moon ruling the treatment. Moon and Capricorn. Well, that sure does involve the teeth, but does this moon look like something that you would want to, to do in this case when that moon is applying to a square of the sun in, in the sixth? That would not be on my top list. Okay, what we do have here, um, we've got Jupiter actually ruling the sixth house. We've got a Jupiter in Virgo again, um, retrograde. So we're seeing that there definitely is something going on here. But my question in looking at this is, and you see that that Jupiter is square Saturn. Um, so my first question with this whole situation was, is, is the, is the treatment that's being proposed going to improve the vitality of the person? There is the moon is making a hard aspect with the planet in the sixth. That's probably not a great idea. The fact that it's moon ruling the 10th is already suggesting that surgery is probably not the uh, the method that would be the most uh, efficacious in this case. And when you and what we're basically seeing with all that Aries in the first house, um, what we're seeing is a lot of inflammation. And you look at this chart in general. You've got you've got the Sun and Mercury both in Aries in in the sixth house. You've got Mars and Sag, you've got Saturn and Sag, and especially the Saturn and Sag, since it does run the teeth. You've got a lot of fire here. 
Now, with fire, you know, we talked about black bile with earth. Well, fire is, of course, yellow bile. Fire is inflammation. Now, what this suggests to me is that there, that there is probably, in this case, inflammation of the gums since the teeth themselves are going to be inflamed. But that the issue is not the physical nature of the teeth, but an inflammatory response. And so this suggests, therefore, that the implants are probably not a very good idea, but the inflammation needs to be dealt with. And then after the inflammation is dealt with, then there can be an assessment of whether or not anything else is necessary. So, uh, so that would be the general physical way of approaching this chart. Now, we do have uh, both physical and spiritual indicators here. The ruler of the ninth is in the sixth, which suggests that there is some spiritual matter that is increasing the illness. The twelfth is in the sixth, which, uh, which also suggests there's, there's some uh, spiritual issue that's involved. And to me, that's enough to look at this and say, huh, that needs more work. That this is not uh, that this is not the right approach. And so this person did not have the dental work done and instead did go on a round of anti-inflammatories and most of the condition receded. So that's pretty much what you would expect when you see this, this combination. Now, I want to skip over a couple of these to make sure we have time to begin here. This is a hoary. Will Reiki help? Okay, well, this is also a discussion about this, but this is the kind of question where you're now pretty much directly up against a spiritual issue in medical. Reiki has a, you know, here, and here you get to, again, how do you define these matters about physical, mental, spiritual? Now, as a simple question, will the Reiki help this, uh, this querent hat had decided that she wanted to treat her condition uh, using Reiki. So I can say, okay, I don't have to deal with what kind of a treatment Reiki is. I just treat it as a 10th house matter. Look at the 10th house, look at the first, look at the sixth and say, will this help? And so when I do that, um, I have Saturn ruling the sixth. It's a very strong Saturn. I have Mercury ruling the treatment. And Mercury is separating from Saturn um, by sextile. And so, and then I look and say, well, does the moon help out with this? Well, the moon goes into, uh, it's about to go into Capricorn, hit the south node, which is definitely a point of weakness or destruction in the chart. So that doesn't look so good. Um, and then it doesn't, um, get to Saturn. Saturn, uh, Saturn's the ruler of the ears. And that was where, um, this person had severe pain in his ears. Um, so, the moon doesn't actually aspect the Saturn. Um, so that doesn't speak to, that doesn't speak to things improving. Um, we can see here that Mercury has kind of gone past the, has already gone past the, the Saturn. And so that also is probably not going to help. There may be a little bit of relief because it is applying to the Mars, thinking about the fact that he's got pain going on. So there may be some relief of the pain, 
but it's not going to it's not going to treat the problem directly. So, yeah, we can answer the question, but it kind of gets around: Is this looking at this as the fact that we're picking a spiritual treatment? The implication is: If you pick a, a spiritual treatment, will it necessarily deal with a non-spiritual disease? Okay. Well, here we look at the disease. It's Saturn. Um, Mars has separated from Saturn. Um, there's there's the suggestion with both of them being in the fifth house that there may have been a digestive issue somehow associated with this. I'll get back to that. But um, but does this look specifically spiritual? Well, the ascendant ruler is afflicted, and the moon's dispositor is afflicted, which are spiritual, but does that actually get us anywhere? Um, it's hard to see Reiki as anything other than a spiritual treatment, because those of you who have experienced Reiki, as I have, um, know that Reiki can be done as, to use an old term, action at a distance. That while most Reiki practitioners would prefer to have you in the room getting treated, you don't have to be. Now, anything that can work at a distance, I pretty much automatically put into the spiritual category. Um, in this case, it just says flat out, it's not going to help. What happened with this guy was this. Um, so, he, as, as I said, he had severe ear pain. One of the people who was trying to help him happened to know Reiki. And so, um, so that, so that was probably the circumstance under which the question was asked to, to begin with. So it was kind of like, that was a convenient thing that could be done. It wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't cost him anything. And this guy was a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a cheapskate. Um, so, and that would have obviously been easier than going through the medical system for this whole thing. What it turned out happened was that he had, um, he had a bacterial infection. This, I think here, it, the, the symbolism is interesting with Mars separating from Saturn. What had happened over a several month period is he had gotten um, a bacterial infection in his inner ear. Now, as you can perhaps uh, see with this, with the moon coming up uh, and going into a sign with the south node, his condition continued to get worse. And what happened during that period of time was, was going up there. And then, of course, as you saw also, it came to, um, to square Mercury, the treatment, um, the treatment that he actually didn't have. But Mercury here also represents him. The pain got worse and worse and worse. The pain did not get better until the physicians correctly diagnosed his problem. I think this is also shown pretty well in the chart. Physician is ruled by um, by Jupiter here. Jupiter is in Capricorn. It's conjunct Pluto. They were convinced he had a tumor. And they ran him through all sorts of uh, MRIs and all sorts of other tests where when they didn't get a result, they thought they didn't have good imaging and maybe the uh, three-dimensional positioning of, the, of the, the images wasn't right. And so for something I'm looking at this April, I don't think he finally started treatment for the, uh, for the infection until maybe September. So, and through all this period of time with Saturn as it was, the pain increased and he basically became deaf in that ear. Uh, ultimately, when they got him into the right treatment, um, the deafness went away, the pain went away. Um, so he was able to be treated, but not by this method. So, um, one of the things we might query here is, was it, would it have been worth it at that time for me to spend more time on the idea that Reiki was spiritual rather than physical? Or did I need, to, or did I just say it's treatment? Don't worry about what it is. It either works or doesn't work. 
I think in this case, I didn't have to worry about the nature of the treatment, but you know, it raises an interesting case. You don't get too many uh, horrors where uh, a treatment that's specified is a spiritual treatment. Um, we can, when we apply these aphorisms systematically, we can see that most disease is actually a mix of the physical and spiritual. And that said, physical treatment generally is pretty appropriate unless the spiritual argument is overwhelming uh, and the physical argument is underwhelming. However, I might add that if even if the spiritual argument is not the strongest, but is still present, it is possible that until you deal with a spiritual issue, the problem may not entirely go away. So I'm going to stop there for general questions.